Yes, Muslims have not only the right but the obligation. It is fard al ain, and in fact, every single Muslim is sinful, is sinful. While any of the lands of the Muslims are occupied by the non-Muslims, we are all sinful until that land has been liberated and been released from the occupation of the disbelievers. There is no doubt about that. This is what Farad al ain means. It means that every single one of us, man, woman and child, are obliged to defend our lands against the attack of our enemies if they have invaded our lands. This is what it means, Farad al ain We're all obliged. And if we don't all do it, we're sinful. Of course, from what I understand, there are many ways to contribute to that. It does not necessarily have to be of your physical presence and fighting. For example, when we were in England, and the jihad was taking place in Bosnia, some of the brothers, alhamdulillah, they went over there to fight. But actually, the message that came to us from Bosnia is we don't need people. We don't need people to come and fight. We've got enough fighters. What they needed was resources in order to be able to get the equipment to defend themselves from the slaughter that the Serbs and the Croatians were perpetuating against them. So therefore, not every jihad and not every situation requires the presence, the actual physical presence. But it requires aid and help of some variety. It could be money, it could be medicine, it could be dua, it could be by talking. It could be by protesting, it could be by talking, it could be by using avenues that are available within the country that we live in order to stop this thing happening. All the Muslims, they have to utilize these different methods in order to defend our brothers and sisters from attack. So, all of us have to contribute in some way. So this depends on the situation and it depends on the particular situation and the particular jihad that is taking place. Okay? So there is no doubt, therefore, that we can contribute with our money, with our intellectual capabilities, with talking, with writing, with speeches, with, of course, dua, as the brother, alhamdulillah, the imam today, was making dua for our brothers and sisters in Chechnya and Palestine and Iraq and many other places, Kashmir, of course, many places where the Muslim lands are being occupied and Muslims are being killed and being slaughtered. So whatever way we can help them, we must help them. And this also makes us understand, brothers and sisters, that it's not, you know, you can't think that you're being a good Muslim and you're free from major sins, that you don't fornicate, you don't drink, you don't, don't take riba, you don't backbite, and you come to the mosque and you pray, and you fast, but you don't do anything to help your brothers and sisters and the lands that are being occupied. No, this is a major sin. Failing to fulfill something that is farad al ain is a major and a very serious sin. So this is all the more imperative of the need for us to get involved. But I would like to mention something as well to my brothers and sisters, that alhamdulillah, that I have, I've never hidden this for lots of reasons, and I don't say this to show off, because in fact, there is nothing for me to show off about. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me in the first war in Afghanistan, when the Russians were in Afghanistan, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me to go over to Afghanistan. But I will tell you a fact. When I went over there, brothers and sisters, what happened was, I had such bad diarrhea, I was going to the loo five times a day. Okay? And you know what? The brothers, the brothers there over in Afghanistan, they said, listen, you know, we don't want to be rude, but when people like you come over, we call you tourists. And in fact, we have to spend a lot of effort looking after you. So brother, you know if you want to help us, go back to England and give dawah and call the people to Islam. That's the best thing you can do to help the jihad. That's what they told me in Afghanistan.
And when I went to Philistine, and this was before I went to Afghanistan, when I went to Philistine, and I went there with Yusuf Islam and 12 other British Muslims at the beginning of the Intifada, we went everywhere, went, and we had the pleasure, by the way, I had the pleasure to meet Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. And I will tell you a story that was narrated, that he narrated to us while we were there. He said that one day a colonel from the Jewish army came to see him and said to him, do you, you know this hadith that talks about the day when the stone will call out and the tree will call out, Oh Abdullah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Do you believe this hadith? And Shaykh Ahmed, he said, of course I believe this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, yes, I believe it as well. I believe it as well. But you know, until that time, can we make some agreement between ourselves? I don't remember what he said in reply to that. <laughs> I can't remember that bit. This is what I remember the Shaykh told us. So we went this, made this visit to Philistine. Alhamdulillah, we saw many different places. And it would be, you know, uh, a lot to talk about it. But again, what did the brothers say to me? They said, Abdurrahim, if you want to help our cause in Philistine, they said, go back to England and bring the people to Islam. Because when they become Muslim, automatically they will be supporting our cause. You see, these brothers really understood what is jihad. They knew that jihad, in fact, is to make the word of Allah the highest. This is its purpose, this is its objective. And alhamdulillah, these brothers had a global vision. They looked at the world in a very big picture. And they understood that it wasn't just a question only of fighting the enemy and so on and so forth. The whole concept is something much, much bigger than that. So anyway, this is the question, this is the way brothers, that I have been told in Afghanistan and Philistine by people there who told me themselves, the way that you can help us, they said, is by giving da'wah. By calling people to Islam and bringing them to Islam. So I pass on to you only their advice. We should help our Muslim brothers and we should help our Muslim sisters. I do not intend to, con uh, to comment on any details or methods that people say, can we use this method, can we use that method, except only to refer to what I know, the ulama that I know about have said, including many years ago, Sheikh Abdulaziz Ibn Baz, many, many years ago, he made very clear statements about the illegality in Islam of attacking buses and airplanes and targeting any type of target that is essentially a civilian target. And he made this statement many, many, many years ago. And this, this position has been confirmed by many, many scholars in Islam. And this is what I believe to be the correct position from my knowledge, which is supported by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught to his companions. In the method that is the manner of the believer, in the way that they fight in the path of Allah. We do not fight the way the kuffar fight. We are not like them. If they rape our women, do we rape their women? If they kill my children, do I kill their children? If as the Serbs, if you know what happened in Bosnia, the Serbs used to rape four-year-old girls. Four-year-old Muslim girls, they used to rape them, and then they would hang their bloody dresses after they'd slaughtered them on the trees so the Muslims could see it. Do we do that back to them? Is that what Allah teaches us? No. No, because Islam does not teach us everything they do to us, we can do to them, because we have limits. Because we are supposed to be better than the kuffar. We are supposed to be better. We have a nobility. Our deen teaches us a nobility, a sacredness. Something that, because our fight is not for us, our fight is for Allah. Our fight is to make the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the highest. And part of that is our nobility. And so we have many, many stories and incidents throughout the history of Islam in the beautiful way and the great manners of the Muslim fighters in the battlefield. And they displayed great honor and dignity and the merciful way that they treated their captives. And this is why we refer to 
the conquest of Islam, not as a conquest, but as a liberation, an opening. And that is why the people used to invite the Muslims to liberate them from the Romans and the Persians. Because that's what it was exactly, a liberation. And the Muslims treated them so much better than the Kuffar. So as for these things, brothers and sisters, then we will call it exactly what it is, terrorism. We don't just say, talk about Muslims, we all know that the Americans are worse terrorists than what the Muslims could ever do. We know that. And the Jews, they are worse terrorists. But that doesn't mean that we want to imitate them. Do we imitate them or are we better than them? We are more noble than them. You know, that doesn't mean that we don't fight. We do fight. But we fight in the way of Allah and we fight according to the rules that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us. So this is what, inshallah, I hope is important to understand, my brothers and sisters.